Hi, welcome, Mikhail. Hi, Dr. Pa. It's so good to see you again. I'm excited to be chatting today. Oh, yes. We haven't chatted for a while, Mikhail. I, I miss these sessions. It's been, it's been a little bit of time, so I'm, I'm excited to catch up, and especially with what we're going to talk about today, because this is something you've been working on for a little bit of time. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the entire project in completion. I've seen bits and pieces, but not everything. I know, and this is something we've been talking about for a while. So what is it that Mikhail and I are going to talk about today? It's the personalized blood sugar response in the management of uh, insulin resistance, basically in the management of your health. So whether it is excessive body fat, whether you have um, mood issues, whether you have low energy, a lot of that is related to how your blood sugar behaves. And of course, blood sugar is related to how, what you eat and how you eat and in what order you eat. This is stuff that Mikhail and I have been talking about for a while. And hopefully we'll have our website, you know, live very soon. We are, we are really waiting for that. Both of us have been working on that for a while. So I'm going to show up, share the screen with the PowerPoint. And okay. So. Where am I? Okay, now there it is. Okay, Mikhail, can you see the screen? I can see it perfectly, Dr. Carl. Okay, I'm going to remove my video. So this was a study that came out in 2015. And personally, I felt that this was a really game changer of an article. So what, what did they do? So this was at the um, Weizmann Weiss, Center in Israel. And what they did is they tracked about 800 people, 50,000 meals, and they tracked continuous blood sugar response along with gut microbiome, inflammatory markers, and a whole lot of markers. So I'm just briefly explaining what they found out and which probably many of you know from, from you know, your own experiences, but this is a scientific explanation of what you have probably experienced in the past. So what they found is the same food did not have the same blood sugar response in everybody. So for example, if I ate a banana, my blood sugar may not rise at all versus Mikhail eating the same banana, but her blood sugar goes up a whole lot more. So many of you knew that. It's like both of you, you and a friend of yours go to, the, go to a restaurant, you order the same kind of food, and you feel that you know while sitting there, you're just gaining weight while your friend never seems to gain any weight at all. So some of the explanations, of course, come in the gut microbiome and how the gut microbiota decide what happens to your food and how you metabolize. So we have been talking about the gut microbiome a lot. You probably find some of the videos on our uh, YouTube channel. But uh, basically, just to go over what we have talked about before, the, there are these bacteria in your gut, in my gut as well, which uh, the, depending on which ones are active at what point in time, will decide how much of your food you're absorbing, for example, carbohydrates, and how much of it you're storing as fat, and what happens to all of that. Now, this is putting it very simply, but of course, one of the big things that affect the gut microbiome is your food, and another major factor is antibiotic usage and the mode of delivery. So mm -hmm. basically, that's just three sentences on the gut microbiome, but what is more interesting is the personalized blood sugar response. So from this study, what they did is they came up with an algorithm, and I, we don't have access to that algorithm, but they said that they could predict what the blood sugar response will be in people. So since we don't have the algorithm, what we decided to do, and this is, this is something a lot of other people have done too. So what we did, and, and if you are my patient, some of you remember that I did send you a chart where I asked you to check your blood sugar fasting using a glucometer eat some food, one hour after that, check your blood sugar, two hours after that, check your blood sugar. And some of you have sent me about 36 to 40 images. <laughs> Truthfully, I have not been able to go through them. Anyway, so we decided to try a, a version of the personalized blood sugar response at, uh, in Mumbai when I was there a few months ago. So the people who took part in this particular, you know, <laughs> experiment in air quotes, 
uh, they were they are not my patients they were just people who couldn't say no to me the people who were my husband's office so i have all i know is none of them are diabetics so if they have any other condition i don't know if they are insulin resistant very likely some of them are and you know why i'm saying that so what we did is essentially used a glucometer so these were the five people who couldn't say no to me <laughs> and this is the glucometer this is something you most of you have seen if you have somebody who's diabetic in your family this is just you uh, use a lance and you take a little drop droplet of blood and you put that on a strip and the number comes up so what did we do now you can see from this picture we took a pre meal blood glucose and a post meal blood glucose and all of them ate the same meal now of course the quantity was probably different this is what they served themselves the first time and what was in the meal i'll, I'll uh, show in a while so what i'm showing here is you can see this gentleman post uh, pre meal his blood glucose was 101 now mikhail would you call that normal uh no <laughs> yeah and he is not a known diabetic of course he's not my patient so i don't know anything more and you can see from just the picture that he's not really overweight so sometimes you know just going by weight and bmi can be very very you know deceptive and particularly in asian indians because they are a uh, lot of indians are thin outside fat inside so tofi next gentleman again 103 post meal was 105 so not a dramatic increase and he had just completed uh, i think it was about a 36 hour fast next again 90 103 8191 134 so my point is number one they all ate the same meals now of course each of them have different biology they are all different age as well but you can see the response the same food did not give the same response for each one of them it was different so what did they eat number one so this dark brown bar was almond flour brownies made with xylitol this was chicken this was a coconut flour roti uh mikhail i think we have a recipe of that in our on our we are going to have it on our website anyway i'm getting ahead this is cooked raw bananas cauliflower rice and coconut flour tikki so tikki is is kind of like a what a fritter kind of a thing so this was this was in mumbai and what happened next okay so this is basically the food that we ate so as you can see from this this was low carbohydrate food and everything was prepared at home so uh, it was all prepared cooked in olive oil and the chicken recipe or the cauliflower rice recipe is nothing i mean unusual about them cauliflower rice we have a bunch of recipes on our website chicken you can prepare any which way you want to at home the ones you're used to coconut flour roti also i think we have a recipe on our website when when we have the website ready so what happened here again i'm going back to that now you can see this gentleman 101 was not really you know pre meal he was supposed to be fasting but what we found out so all of us had this meal at around i think it was around 6 6:30 in the evening so that is not normal dinner time in india most people in india have their you know dinner way later at least 8:30 9 9:30 sometimes it's even 10 o'clock by the time they reach home so i asked him when his post meal glucose came 141 i said i asked him what did you eat for lunch so he said that he ate a heavy carbohydrate meal for lunch and it was in a in a restaurant so one of those fast food places where probably the oil was also suspect so it's not my point is it's not just what you're eating at that point it's also possibly what you've eaten before now his the blood sugar response there wasn't a dramatic rise in his blood sugar this is very interesting it's like 103 and 105 similarly hers was also not a dramatic rise uh, hers was a 10 uh, mg per deciliter and she is somebody who doesn't have excess body fat and this guy again not a whole lot of rise but his pre meal was also not normal and he his doctor says he's not diabetic so he's not a known diabetic but i would differ in that so my point is same food different responses in everyone and obviously when someone asks me or mikhail you know what do you think i should eat and the answer is is very different for different people so um, 
what else did we did we find out so this was my own response and this is a slide probably many of you have seen when i had shown my personalized blood sugar response so i was wearing a abbott libre pro monitor and i ha i have shown that in some other uh, video so i had a continuous blood glucose monitor it was the same day uh, same meal i had the same meal i had an extra helping of uh, almond flour brownies <laughs> And you can see here, so I didn't have a break, breakfast. I don't eat breakfast anymore. And my fasting blood sugar was 2.7. So by some definitions, I should have been feeling, you know, unwell and, you know, dizzy and all of that. Because very often, Mikhail, do you find this, uh, people telling you this, that if I don't eat, I'm going to be hypoglycemic and going to feel dizzy? Do they say that to you? Oh, yes, and the hangry feeling and all of that. And, and that's an entire, we can do an entire chat about what that is and, and why that happens. But yes, people, um, people who don't manage, whose blood sugar isn't well managed or well controlled have huge swings and, um, and their bodies don't deal well with the swings. That's the dizziness, the nausea, that hangry feeling. If I don't eat now, I'll bite your head off tight. <laughs> You know what? Quite a lot of it, I would suspect, is also, uh, you know, depends on our thinking. Because I was some, uh, maybe even a year ago, I was like that. And it wasn't even, you know, the hunger, feeling of hunger. It was more mental. It's like, I haven't eaten for a long time. So that was before I had fasted. So pre-fasting and post-fasting was a very different, That that is what I keep saying. My relationship to food has changed so dramatically. I can't even can't even imagine I thought like that about food. So going back to me, I get to talk about myself. <laughs> okay. So here I was at 48 milligram per deciliter or 2.7 millimoles per liter. And I think, Mikhail, if I'm not wrong, diabetics are told they shouldn't drive if, if it is less than three millimoles per liter. Am I right? Um, I think it depends on the doctor, but between three and a half and three, yeah. Yeah. So this is a point when I shouldn't be driving. Anyway, I wasn't driving in Mumbai. But my, my point is, I was not feeling unwell, nothing at all. I didn't realize I, my blood sugar was here if I didn't wear that monitor. So another point, if you are somebody who feels that time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, these are not things you can do because you're going to become very glyce hypoglycemic. And again, I'm not talking about diabetics. Diabetics is a different conversation. You need to have a physician monitoring all of this. But if you are one of those people who feel, as Mikhail says, hangry, you probably would benefit by wearing a continuous blood sugar monitor to really check whether your blood sugars really come down to the level where you feel unwell. So this was one. So this is when we, we had the low carbohydrate food. And here it says 1751. So it was almost 6 p.m. And then my blood sugar went up. So this was what I ate fairly low carbohydrate. It went up to 5.5 millimoles per liter. For those of you who are used to milligram, it was 99. And this was one hour after food, not two hours. So some people have a spike of blood sugar at one hour. Some people may have earlier. Some people may have at two hours. But what you can see on, in this graph is this was a gradual fall. So, and then of course it fell and then again it rose. I think I ate something else after that. So my point is, this is sort of a very nice gradual fall, not like, you know, suddenly peaking at two, one hour, then maybe continuing like that. And then a drastic fall, which makes you feel hangry. And of course, the reason was because I had eaten low carbohydrate food. Now, I won't say this was high fat because the only fat that came was in the cooking. So most of the cooking was with coconut oil and olive oil. So, and I didn't eat avocado or anything, nothing extra fat, no, no cream in my tea or coffee or anything like that. So my point is because of the low carbohydrate meal, my blood sugars were kind of even. And of course, I didn't feel hung, hangry, angry, anything of that sort, even before I had eaten. And this is some, this actually, you know, when you do a continuous blood sugar monitoring, many of you will probably get some big surprises. We've had some other clients who've had big surprises from food that they didn't realize was actually not really healthy for them. And, and there was another study with bread as well. So some of you are probably thinking that your sourdough, 
ancient grain, whatever. I don't even know. Some, some of our patients have said that they actually, they have somebody who grows the grains. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to go to that much trouble. <laughs> anyway, so this is like a very, very special bread. And one particular study that, uh, again, doctors, um, Iran, uh, Elena and Siegel had done, the same uh, authors of the study that I'd shown at the beginning of this, this video, where they found that white bread and sardo bread did not show a whole lot of difference in the response. So my point is not that you start eating bread. First figure out whether you know the one that you think is the healthier option, whether it's really healthier for you or not. So uh, I'll stop sharing the screen. And Mikhail, uh, what would you like to add to that? Well, Dr. one of the things I definitely want to point out is that your blood sugar after a meal, and no matter what you eat, low carb, high carb, it doesn't matter, there will be a change in your blood sugar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your blood sugars after a meal was lower than some of the participants before the meal. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and the interesting thing is when we look at the thresholds for diabetes, uh, or what the conventional medical world considers the threshold for diabetes, which is a fasting blood sugar of a certain amount, which means when there's no food in the system, how much sugar is still floating around in your bloodstream, um, your blood sugar after food was still lower than the threshold for diabetes. Oh, yeah. So the threshold for diabetes, I think, in conventional uh, labs is... Um, more than 110. So 110 it, to 120. Yeah, so in, in Mikhail and my world, <laughs> it is less than 90 for sure. We would like it to be between 80 and 85. And why do we say that? Studies have shown that even if you are not diabetic, if you have suboptimal blood sugar, and for us, suboptimal is more than 4.9 in millimoles, more than 90 in milligrams you are still at a very high risk for heart disease, type two diabetes, dementia, cancer, and all the ones you want to talk about. So you will not find Mikhail and me talking about diabetes. Very often we're talking about insulin resistance rather than diabetes. And the other major component of insulin, which we can't measure today as a continuous basis, is your insulin levels, the hormone insulin that your body makes. So insulin resistance, to put it in a very, uh, you know, simple and very highly simplified way, your insulin can be very high or it could be very low too. So having an exceptionally low fasting insulin may not be the, the best thing too. So there are, there are a lot of details, you know, the devil is in the details. I'm not going into the technical conversation here, but I'm just warning all of you that just because your fasting insulin is three, it's not, it's, it may not be that exciting. <laughs> okay, so that's all from both of us now until the next time. And I hope the next time we have our website ready. <laughs> yes, well, and uh, yeah, and I look forward to actually having discussions with, with people about personalized blood sugar response because what would be interesting, because yours and my heritage are so different. Like all the people who you tested have so, had similar-ish heritages to some degree. I oh, they're all similar. Yes, they're all of, all Asian Indians. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't think I, if I have any Asian Indian in me, it's very, very like the teeny tiniest of amounts. So what would be interesting, because there's such a genetic component to this as well, would be to see the difference between your blood sugar response to something and mine. And maybe that's something we should... Uh, we should play around with for another. For yes, another. We, are, we are going to do that. So keep, keep watching our videos. We are going to keep telling you all the self-experimentation that we do. And Mikhail is a great one for self-experimentation. Maybe someday, Mikhail, you're going to talk about that all potato diet. What was it? Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm digressing. Oh, no, you know what, though? It's, it's good because I, there's not much that I read about or talk about. If it interests me, I'll do it. To, I'll, I'll do it before I, before I talk about it, just so that at least, if nothing else, I can give some personal experience. Yeah. Okay. So bye now. Thanks, everyone.